folks, HR Funk here. With a video that was brought about by several comments I've received from viewers over the past year or so, all of which, one way or another, commented on what all goes into making a firearms video. Now, something I don't think I've ever mentioned before is that I'm a pretty big movie buff. And although I haven't been real crazy about some of the things that have come out of Hollywood in the last two or three decades, there are a lot of movies I like. And with those movies that I like, I particularly enjoy seeing the behind the scenes videos where the producer or the director goes back and shows all the people involved in the movie making process doing the things that they do. And along those same lines, I thought some of you might be interested in seeing what all goes into making a firearms video or specifically what goes into making an HR Funk video. So this video is going to be just dedicated to a behind the scenes look at what goes into making one of my videos. Something I have to admit at the outset is I have no history in photography or videography. Now that might be painfully obvious to some of you who actually know something about those topics, but I am completely self-taught when it comes to making these videos. I came into this YouTube venture as an instructor, and I've told the story before, but I'll repeat it briefly here. Back around 2012 or so, I was getting to the point where I was watching a lot of YouTube videos, and I thought it was a pretty good medium for conveying information about firearms, but a lot of what I was seeing in the videos back in those days either was information that was inaccurate or information that was presented in such a way that I thought it cast firearms owners or firearms aficionados in a poor light. Also, some of it was just plain kind of boring. And at the time, I thought I was a pretty good instructor and I thought I could present more accurate information in a way that was less offensive or unoffensive and at the same time maybe even be a little bit entertaining. So when I first started to record videos, and this has now been over seven years ago, I started out just trying to convey information the way that I did when I was teaching a class. Unfortunately, the environment in a classroom is different than the environment when I'm recording a video. When I have people there that I'm instructing, it's easier to come across with more of your personality and try to keep the class interesting and entertaining. My very first videos on YouTube, and they're still up, when I go back and look at them, as I do from time to time, just to see how far I've come, those very first videos are not very good. They're very robotic, they're monotone. I really am not coming across with any kind of personality in those videos. Now, the information was still pretty good, so I was at least conveying good information, but it just wasn't presented very well. So one of the things that I've done over the years is I actually watch these videos and I watch them very critically and I try to look at ways that I can improve both my on-screen presentation and my off-screen video production to make these videos look better, to make them sound better, to make them more entertaining, and to just make them more enjoyable to watch for those of you on the other side of the camera. Hand in hand with being self-taught, and having to learn things as I've gone along, I'm also a one-man show. Now you may have noticed in other YouTube videos, a lot of times the main person involved in the video has other people helping out with the production. Many times there's someone operating the camera and following the main person in the video as they talk about the things they're talking about and demonstrate the things that they're demonstrating. And other times you might see even more people involved in the video production. For me, I'm it. And one of the things, particularly when I'm out on the range, if I don't catch something immediately when it happens, or if I'm just not aware of it until later on when I'm reviewing the video, or sometimes even when I'm back here editing the video, I might have to make corrections either in editing, or sometimes you'll see the little notice come up at the bottom of the screen where I will hear myself say something during the editing process that I know was not accurate and I'm trying to correct it that way. Sometimes I'm able to edit those sections out of the video and not lose really anything in the content. But again, I don't have anyone else helping me out and my cameras are stationary. So sometimes that presents a little bit of a challenge, but over the years, I've pretty much figured out how to work around the stationary cameras and how to still get the video that I want to present for all of you to see. And speaking of editing, that reminded me of one other thing that I wanted to tell you about. 
sometimes the things that you see in the final video I don't see or hear when I'm recording the video. Things like in the firearms qualification videos where I will inset myself giving specific commands to the shooter, I don't actually see or hear. Or at the end of the video where I'm talking about my discount code for Optics Planet and I go like this, I don't see anything out there. I just have to imagine those things. So later on, during the editing process, I put those effects in. But along with everything else that's required to produce these videos, it takes a little bit of imagination and even a little bit of acting on the part of the person doing the presentation. next time, folks, good shooting. Another thing you may have noticed about my videos over the years is they are recorded in short segments, normally no longer than two or three minutes at one time. And the reason for that is because I go back and review those segments after I record them and see if I made any errors or if I need to correct something. And for example, the last segment that you just saw, I recorded two different takes because I didn't really like the way it sounded the first time. So I recorded a second take of it. I liked the second one better. So I used that take and that was the one that you just saw. Also, if I make a mistake, instead of having to re-record a long section of video, or in some cases an entire video, I only have to re-record that segment. So that's why you'll see the transition from segment to segment in my videos, because it makes it easier for me, as one person, to record a video that's going to be more enjoyable, and hopefully just a little bit better for you to watch on your end. The short takes also help out sometimes when unexpected things happen. And as you know, I do a lot of recording outdoors. And out in nature, pretty much anything can happen. And sometimes I'll have a situation just like this. For the next stage of this Arkansas course, I'm back to a distance of seven yards from the target. And I have a train going by. And that's a very good example of how the short takes help out. When that train came through, I was able to stop the recording, wait until the train went by, and then after it went by, just re-record that short segment rather than having to re-record a more lengthy segment of video or deciding that it was too much work to re-record the lengthy segment of video and just leaving the train in there. So now it's time to talk about what goes into actually recording a specific video. Now to begin with, Recording a video or the video that you ultimately see actually begins days or sometimes weeks or months before it ever appears on YouTube. I will have an idea for a video and I will conceptualize it. And in my mind, I try to imagine what I want the final video to look like. From that point, I start to plan exactly how I'm going to record or produce the video that I want you to see. Sometimes that planning stage lasts for a long time. I have to think about what type of firearms I'm going to be using. I have to think about any other equipment that I'm going to need, like speed loaders or holsters or what have you. Sometimes I have to think about other gear. If I'm doing, for example, a segment on firearms repair, or I'm showing a modification or something like that, I have to have the right tools. I have to make sure that I understand the process myself and that I can articulate it well so that you can both see what I'm doing and understand what I'm saying as I'm presenting that to you. So many times there's a lot of planning before any camera is ever turned on or any recording is ultimately made. Sometimes the planning involves taking notes and even reducing those notes to writing and periodically I will post an outline behind the camera. I'm not reading it. I don't have cue cards. I don't have a teleprompter or anything like that. But between the segments, I can check my outline, and I actually have one for this video. Hanging right behind the camera here. So between segments, I can take a look at this and see if I've forgotten to say anything, or if maybe something that I said wasn't quite the way I intended to say it. And as I said before, I can then go back and re-record that segment. So this is a helpful way, particularly when I'm in the shop here, to be able to stay on track not go down too many bunny trails around in the weeds and basically stay on topic and make sure that I hit all the things that I want to cover in the video. Something else I have to do 
And this is especially true with the qualification challenge videos. I have to read those course descriptions and try to understand as best I can what that course of fire requires so that when I demonstrate it and when I explain it to you, I'm demonstrating it properly and conveying good information. Now you may re recall just a couple of weeks ago, I had to completely re-record and represent the main course because I didn't understand the course description to begin with. So I try to avoid that as best I can, but sometimes if something like that happens, I am not opposed to going back and first off saying, hey, I made a mistake and secondly, re-recording the video to show you something the proper way. Once I've acquired everything that I need for the video and I've done all of the required research, I start to look at what day I am actually going to record a particular video. And this requires a couple of other steps. First off, I have to check my own personal schedule because between my full-time job between everything my wife is doing with her various jobs and everything my teenage daughter has going on in her life, a lot of times trying to carve out the necessary two, three, or four hours to record a video is a bit of a challenge. When I have time in my personal schedule, I have to look at the weather for that day and see if that's going to be good enough to allow me to record a video. Now, I'm not above going out in inclement weather, and you've seen some of my videos where I'm out in the snow or where I'm out in the rain recording or shooting or doing whatever I'm doing, but there are a couple of considerations along with the weather. First off, the weather has an effect on my lighting. Here in Ohio, the sun is in different parts of the sky during different times of the year, and that really has a bearing on when I can record good video. You may recall some of my videos that I have recorded with other than optimal lighting conditions and you'll either see a glare behind me or I'm shooting in a shadow or whatever. A lot of times that's because otherwise I have good weather that day and I have time in my schedule to record that video but I just don't have the optimal weather or in that case lighting conditions. The weather can also have an impact on whether or not I can even get to the range. As you'll see here shortly the route that I take to the range that I use most often in these videos is not exactly a nice smooth paved driveway. It does present some challenges and again you'll see that here shortly. The last thing that I have to be concerned with in terms of weather is my equipment. My recording equipment is not exactly weatherproof and I have to be concerned about it being damaged because of rain or sometimes not necessarily damaged but just its performance is impacted. If I'm out during very cold weather a lot of times the battery life for my cameras is severely diminished. Sometimes I have to stop the recording and get into my Jeep and charge things up with my cigarette lighter charger and then get back out and continue recording the video just to keep those batteries going during cold weather. So weather has a number of impacts or influences on my ability to record these videos and I always have to be cognizant of it in my planning stage. One other thing that I have to think about, and this is a little thing, but it is something I have to give some thought to, is the clothing that I'm going to wear in a given video. Now, this is because I don't have anyone in charge of wardrobe for me to think about this ahead of time and help me out, so I have to make these decisions myself. And you may have noticed in my videos, I try to match whatever clothing I'm wearing to the video topic of the day. If I'm presenting a law enforcement qualification challenge video, I try to wear something that makes me look more like a police officer. If I'm shooting a service rifle or I'm doing something with a more military oriented flair, I'll normally wear some version of a Marine Corps uniform, either a current uniform or more often some sort of a vintage Marine Corps uniform. If I'm presenting something here in the shop, I may well be dressed just the way I am right now. So. Again, the clothing that I'm going to wear is a little consideration, but it is something I have to think about before I start to record the video. When it comes to actually recording the video, I typically have two different venues or two main venues that I use. One is here in the shop and the other one is on whatever range that I'm using that day. One of the things about recording here in the shop that's nice is it's a controlled environment. Here, particularly if I'm showing some sort of firearms repair or maintenance, or if I'm doing a technical review of a firearm, or anything where I want to focus on the firearm itself or 
the process of my doing something and it doesn't involve actually live firing of the firearm, I like to do here in the shop. That's why when I do my reviews, typically I'll divide them almost evenly between my shop review of a firearm and then the live fire on the range portion of the video where I actually demonstrate that firearm's performance. Again, the shop is a controlled environment, so I don't have to worry about lighting, I don't have to worry about temperature, I don't have to worry about weather, and I can record here basically any time of day or night, and it looks the same on your end. I've recorded videos here in the shop late at night, into the very wee hours of the morning, and all other hours of the day, so that makes it very convenient to be able to record video just like I'm doing right now here in the shop. Now, interesting, interestingly, when I'm here, my view that I have the entire time looks just like this. So to me, this is pretty much what all of you look like the whole time that I am presenting whatever information I have here in the shop. Now, this may seem like a little thing, but again, when I have live people in front of me that I'm teaching or instructing, it's easier to get feedback and understand whether or not I'm communicating effectively. But when this is all that I see, I don't get that feedback, which is another reason I go back and review these segments and try to decide for myself if I'm able to or if I'm amply communicating whatever message I'm trying to in that particular video. By the way, the controlled environment aspect of recording indoors is precisely why you see some YouTubers that essentially have a set, and they present their entire video from that set indoors, and sometimes they'll edit in segments of shooting out of doors if they're talking about a firearm or they're talking about something that actually requires them to be on the range, and you'll see those segments of video that they edit in, but all of their presentation comes from the shop that actually makes things a little bit easier than the way I do things. Because when they're out recording those segments, they can take video of whatever they want to take video of and then select the segments that look the best and just edit those into the video. And again, since the entire presentation is inside in that controlled environment, it doesn't impact their ability to talk about whatever their topic is and then show those video clips. Now again, the way I do it is more difficult. That goes along with being a Marine. If there's a difficult way to do th something and an easy way to do something, the Marines will take the harder way. But along with that, I also feel like when I record video on the range, I'm able to give you instant feedback on anything that occurs. I think the information you get from me, even though it's essentially right off the top of my head, it's as it happens. It's fresher, if you will than it is when someone records that video and then comes back and thinks about it for a while or maybe even forgets something that happened with a particular firearm. With me on the range, if something happens, you see it and I'm able to comment on it right away. And again, that's a more difficult way to do it because when I get out to the range, I'm dealing with whatever the environmental conditions are there. I'm trying to shoot and I'm trying to record video and I'm trying to talk and there's a mental exercise involved in doing all those things and still being able to shoot accurately. Now on one hand it probably helps out with regard to my shooting because it helps me to block out all of those exterior distractions and still have to shoot accurately. But on the other hand it would be a lot easier if all I had to concentrate on on the range was shooting with a video camera recording, especially if somebody else was holding that camera, and then actually presenting my topic back here in the controlled environment of the shop. And I suppose that's a pretty good segue in this video for the next portion where I'm going to pack up and take you along as I head out to the range. When I finally have the right combination of time and weather to actually go out to the range and record the video, the next thing I have to do is start to pack things up and make sure that I don't forget anything. This actually takes a little bit more effort than you might think because unlike a normal trip to the range where all I have to do is make sure I have my firearms, ammunition, targets, and whatever support gear like holsters and magazines and such, I also have to make sure I don't forget any of my recording gear. I also have to make sure before I start to pack things up that 
all the batteries for my cameras are charged and everything else is ready to go. I have had instances where I've arrived out at the range and either didn't have the right piece of gear, you may recall one video where pretty spectacularly I did not have the right speed loader with me and I ended up making the video with the speed loader that I had and making do, but it would have been better if I'd had the right one to begin with. Also, I've had instances where I've had to make emergency trips back home from the range because whatever I forgot was so critical to the video that I was not able to make the video without it. Now, if I go to the range where I usually record videos, that's not too bad because it's only about 10 minutes away from my house. But if I go to some of the farther ranges, that can completely ruin my entire plan for a video by not having a piece of critical gear. Now, as I mentioned, the trip to the range is only about a 10 minute drive from my house, which is nice, but it's not without its challenges, which I'll demonstrate here momentarily. Oh, by the way, this is Oliver. He's my wife's dog, and you may have noticed him make a cameo appearance in several videos. I bring him out here with me a lot of times so he can run around and get some exercise while I'm recording a video. Now this is the part of the trip where it can get interesting. You may have also noticed in a lot of my videos you will hear a train in the background and part of the reason is because the range that I use is right along a railroad track and in fact I have to drive along the railroad track to access it and it looks like today the folks from the railroad are doing some work so I'm probably going to have to do some sort of stunt driving in order to get around them. So after a quick conversation with the friendly railroad employees, I'm back on route to the range. And this is the part of the trip where I have to veer off of the railroad tracks and into the woods. By the way, this is another reason that weather has such a bearing on my ability to record these videos. Now my Jeep does a very good job getting through most conditions to get me back here, but if there's several feet of snow, I don't want to run the risk of getting stuck and then having to leave my Jeep here until the spring thaw. So after our little off-road adventure, we've arrived at the range. Now once I get here, I have all of the setup typically associated with a trip to the range. I have to get targets in place and load up magazines and one thing and another. But I also have some additional setup, mostly involving placing of cameras and some other considerations that I'll go into here momentarily. Once I've completed the basic setup for the course, meaning the target is in place, magazines are loaded and all that, the next thing I have to do is make sure the cameras are properly positioned. And this is one of those things, in fact, the next several things I mention are things that if I do them right, you as the viewer will never notice. But if I do them wrong, it will be very apparent and it will take away from the quality of the video. My target camera, I have to make sure has the target centered in the field of view because when I do the split screen that I typically use for these videos if it is off center at all the target is not going to be centered in the split screen there's going to be part of it that's cut off same thing with the camera that's focused on me I have to make sure that my body or usually what I try to center in the screen is the firearm that I'm using for that video if the firearm is in the very center of the screen that's facing me then when I do the split screen it's still going to be in the center of my half of the split screen even if a portion of my body gets cut off. Now I've discovered that if I put a little bit more distance between myself and the camera I don't have as much of a problem with cutting off portions of my body but still particularly if I'm shooting in a prone position or something like that I might lose maybe part of my legs or even the lower half of my body and there's just not much that I can do about that. This is also the reason that I use the picture-in-picture sometimes because there might be a significant portion of me or what I'm doing that is out of the frame on the split screen but I can use the picture in picture and you can still see what I'm doing and still see the target view as well. The problem with the picture in picture and the reason that I don't use it very often is because it makes the image of the target so small that if someone's watching it on a phone they have a hard time seeing the impacts of the bullets and I like to shoot these so that you can see the result of the shot basically as soon as I fire it. That's just a, a part of my videos that I like to have in there for you, the viewer, to be able to see. 
hand in hand with positioning the cameras and making sure that the image is correct in the view screen, I also have to think about lighting. Now today we have very heavy cloud cover and it's overcast, which diffuses the light and I really don't have too much trouble as far as shadows on my face or shadows somewhere that I don't like them or whatever. But there are some days that I come out here and I literally will take the camera and rotate it 360 degrees to see, <laughs> almost knocked my camera over, to see which direction gives me the best lighting for the image that you're seeing on your end. Now when I'm doing the actual shooting portion of the video, I normally can't do that because the targets have to be positioned so that the bullets are going to go into the backstop, which is why sometimes you'll see as I'm shooting those portions of the video, I'm either in a shadow or maybe there's a lot of bright sunlight that's sort of causing some distortion in the image. I can't do anything about that because the targets have to be placed in certain places for safety reasons. But the parts where I'm just talking like I am now, I will take the time to try to make sure I get the best lighting possible. So again, you as the viewer have the best possible image for you to be able to see. Now the other thing that I struggle with a lot is my sound. And I have never figured out exactly why it is sometimes the sound will drop off and all of a sudden I'm quieter in a particular segment than I am in another segment and other times I'm a lot louder. I really have gotten to the point where I almost think it has to do with which direction the wind is blowing and if it's blowing my voice toward the microphone it picks it up better and if it's blowing my voice away from the microphone it doesn't pick it up as well. So once I have everything in place, it's time to start actually recording the video. This is where I record my opening, Hi, and Good I will discuss here. whatever the topic of that video is going to be, and then sooner or later I get around to doing some shooting, usually. I do not use any kind of cue cards, any kind of teleprompter, or anything like that. What you hear coming from me basically is coming right off the top of my head, which is why sometimes you'll hear me stumble over my words or mispronounce something or otherwise have something that I don't pronounce quite the way I'd like to. Sometimes I'll forget to say things, and then I'll come back later on in the video because I'll realize I forgot to say it and insert it later. And then sometimes I don't notice that until I'm doing the editing portion, which is when you'll see the little banner appear at the bottom to try to correct or add whatever I forgot to say into the video. Now keep in mind, all of this changes throughout the video. Many times I have to move the camera to a different position the target camera usually stays stationary, but sometimes when I'm shooting at 25 yards, especially if I'm shooting from the barricade over here, I will move the target to that target stand because that's 25 yards from the barricade. It's also 15 yards from the 15 yard point of cover that I typically use with the tires. So it makes it convenient. I can fire both the 15 yard stage and the 25 yard stage with the target on that stand. For the closer stages, I'll move it over to this target stand. So again, I have to move cameras, recheck everything, look at the lighting, look at the camera angle, make sure everything's centered in the frame and all that. And as I move from position to position or distance to distance, the camera that's on me has to move along. So I have to recheck those things and reset them every stage of the way as I'm recording the video. Now keep in mind, I'm thinking about all of this. I'm thinking about trying to speak and sound reasonably intelligent, and I'm still trying to shoot relatively accurately as I'm firing at the target so it doesn't look like I'm somebody who doesn't know how to shoot. So there is a lot going on when I am out here recording these videos, and again, trying to juggle all that and come up with a video on your end that you're going to enjoy and actually watch is a little bit of a challenge. Now I enjoy it, it's fun, but it's more work than you might expect. When it comes to recording the live fire segments for my videos, this aim cam footage does a pretty good job of showing you what everything looks like from my perspective. Now one thing I'd like to point out is the positioning of the cameras and how close they are to my line of fire. And this is one of those little distractions that's always in the back of my mind when I'm trying to shoot. Now in this particular video, the distance to the target is close enough and the cameras are far enough out of the line of fire that I'm not too terribly concerned. But as the distances grow, the chances become greater and greater that one bad shot could potentially cost me a camera. And this is another one of those things that's always 
a little distraction in the back of my mind when I'm trying to shoot accurately. So at this point, the recording part of the video is done. Now it's time to pack things up and get ready to go. And really, this is only one part. I'm going to get into it in a little bit here in the next segment of this video where I start to talk about editing and some of the post-production things that I have to do. But this part took about two and a half hours, maybe three hours from the time that I got here this morning. And this was one of the shorter qualification courses that I've recorded so far in this series. So again, there is a significant time investment when it comes to recording these videos. Once I finish recording the video on the range, it's time to come back and edit the video. And editing is something that I have really developed an appreciation for over the years. I can remember years ago when I would see someone win an Academy Award for editing a motion picture, and I would think, really? Editing? They get an award for that? All they really do is splice the movie together and make sure it goes from the beginning to the end and doesn't miss something in the middle. Well, I was wrong. And editing is a huge part of the creative process. In fact, I can remember it was a famous director. It was Steven Spielberg or George Lucas or someone along those lines who said that the editor writes the final draft of the screenplay. And they really do, because through editing, you can completely change a segment of video, or in my case, I can take a so-so segment of video and make it into a good segment of video, I can correct mistakes, or if I do it poorly, I can take what should be a good segment of video and make it into a not so good segment of video. Through editing, I add all of the special effects that you see in the final video, and at least 50% of the final video product comes about as a result of editing. The intro is put in during editing, all the music that you hear is put in during the editing process, the split screen effect that I use is put in, or the picture in picture, all of that comes about as a result of the editing process. I use Apple's iMovie software, and again, I'm not someone who is extremely literate in terms of computers or with using this software and I've had to learn how to use this along the way, and I think I've gotten better and better at it, but I still don't think I'm nearly as good as someone who is really proficient with Apple's iMovie. Again, I'm probably doing it the hard way, Semper Fi. But through my editing, I'm able to get the video to finally look the way I want it to look when you see it on screen. Also, the editing process adds a significant amount of time to the video production. Normally, however long it takes me to record the video, I can pretty much double that, and that's what it's going to be from the time the video is recorded until I'm finished editing it. So if I spend two and a half hours on the range recording the video, I'm probably going to have about two and a half hours invested in editing the video before I can upload it to YouTube. And speaking of YouTube, I can tell you that uploading firearms content to YouTube is just as much of a challenge as always. In fact, what I've gotten to the point of doing is once I've completed a video, I upload it to YouTube and monetize it, but I leave it set on private. The reason I do that is almost immediately, within minutes of one of my videos being uploaded, YouTube demonetizes it. Then there's what is essentially an appeals process that I can go through and ostensibly a live human being familiar with the subject matter looks at my video and then determines whether or not it violates YouTube's policies. Since I've been doing this, most of my videos, once someone reviews them, have been approved to receive advertising revenue. There have been a couple that have not, and there's no rhyme or reason between the ones that are approved to receive advertising revenue and the ones that are not approved. The virtually very same videos, and when you think about something like the firearms qualification videos, which are very similar to each other, some of those have been demonetized, some of them have not. And to try to distinguish why one is and one isn't is virtually impossible. But since I've been uploading them and giving the YouTube people a chance to look at them before they go live, 
I've had more success at keeping my videos monetized than when I was just uploading them and allowing them to go live right away. This also is why I've been using the Premiere process because I will upload the video usually on a Sunday or a Monday. It normally takes a day or two to go through this appeal procedure. Then I'll set the Premiere on a Wednesday when everyone gets the notice and the video goes live on Saturday morning when everyone who wants to show up is here and we do the live chat and all that. By the way, this is right where I'm sitting while we're live chatting. And that upload process and appeal procedure is the last step before all of you see the video. At that point, it's obviously completely recorded, all the editing is done and everything else. So we've now gone all the way from conceptualizing the video, through planning, through recording, through editing, to finally uploading to YouTube. And the last thing is for you to actually watch the video. And there you have it, folks. That's what's involved in making an HR Funk firearms video. I hope you enjoyed this behind the scenes look. And if you have any questions or comments on this video, as always, make sure you forward those to me. Remember, if you order anything from Optix Planet, be sure to use my discount code, which is... And if you use that discount code, it's good for 5% off anything you order from Optix Planet. See you next time, folks. And until then, good shooting. Bye-bye.